So I've worked in the area of science and religion for quite a few years now. I initially became interested in it when I was an undergraduate. I did philosophy and theology. And my interest in those subjects was really an interest in the big questions asking about how to understand the universe and our place within it. So yeah, my interest started as an undergraduate and then I went on to do a master's and a PhD in the philosophy and physics of time and looking at how we might think about the interaction between religion or theology and time. And so I'd been working in the intersection between physics and religion for a while. And I was invited to go to a quantum theology beyond Copenhagen workshop, which was run by Professor Mark Harris, who was then at the University of Edinburgh and is now at the University of Oxford. And the real motivation for the project was to try and push science and religion as a field to engage with interpretations of quantum mechanics that weren't just the Copenhagen interpretation, because science and religion has been really dominated by the Copenhagen approach. And so um, Professor Harris's motivation was to try and get us to expand our horizons a bit. And so he invited me to contribute an article and I had to think about what I wanted to write on. And the many worlds interpretation really jumped out at me as an interpretation of quantum mechanics that's really metaphysically rich and fascinating and had a lot of scope to be engaged with in a way that hadn't been before. And it was really a surprise to me actually to learn that people in science and religion hadn't really thought about the many worlds interpretation up until this point. So I noticed that there was a gap and I thought, well, what a perfect opportunity for me to swoop in and see if I can make sense of the many worlds interpretation and what it might mean for Christianity and for religion in general. Yeah, so the Everett interpretation basically says that the universe evolves in accordance with the Schrodinger equation and instead of at a particular quantum event there being a range of possible outcomes that occur and only one outcome occurs, instead the universal wave function splits and so every possible outcome that can occur does occur. Now this differs from textbook quantum mechanics or the Copenhagen interpretation which says that nature is fundamentally indeterministic and in a quantum event there's a range of possible outcomes that can occur the wave function collapses and picks one outcome and that's a can be predicted probabilistically but not with certainty so there's only one outcome that occurs but you don't know in advance what that outcome is going to be whereas the Everett interpretation says you can predict with certainty what's going to happen because everything that's possible does happen. So every position that the electron could take is taken. Um, and this, it has really radical implications for how we understand the nature of the world, because this idea of the universal wave function splitting or branching basically means that the universe splits into multiple universes or many worlds, which is where the, the name the many worlds interpretation comes from. So you have a universe that every time a quantum event happens is splitting into the number of branches that there are possible outcomes of the event. So thinking about what this means for human beings, it means that there may well be many versions of us in these many different branches. So it's really quite radical. It's quite difficult to get your head around initially. And definitely when I first encountered it, I thought this cannot be right. But the more I've looked into it, the more I've thought actually this is quite a plausible way for understanding the world. I'm not, I don't think I want to jump on the bandwagon and say, I definitely think that it's true, but I think that it's robust enough and solid enough to be taken very seriously. And so um, that's why I was interested in studying the philosophical and theological implications of this idea that the universe isn't singular. There isn't just one universe, but instead there are many branching universes that are continuously splitting all the time. Yeah, so fission is an idea that's built upon the concept of cell fission. So when cells split into one or more, or into two identical copies or more, more. And philosophers 
started thinking about what this might mean if people could undergo fission. So fission is a thought experiment that arises in the philosophical literature on personal identity. And the idea is to kind of test out different ways of understanding personal identity um, in different contexts. So fission experiments or fission thought experiments imagine that a human could split into two exact copies of their past self. So this, uh, the thought experiments taken a few different forms. One of them is imagining that you are teleported into onto another planet, but the teleportation device breaks down and instead of you moving from one location to the other, there's suddenly two of you. Another one involves splitting your brain in half into its hemispheres and transplanting those hemispheres into two bodies. So you have, um, basically in fission cases, the thing, the common theme that runs through all of them is that you have two people who seem to have an equal claim to being a past person. But now that there's, now there's two of them instead of one. So can we say that that original individual has survived? What does that survival look like? They both, both of the new individuals, the post split or post fission individuals feel very strongly that they are the same person as they were before the split. They have psychological continuity with that past person, but suddenly you've got two people. Um, and so the, the philosophical literature considers what might happen in these cases and how to make sense of identity in the context of splitting. Now, um, in the literature on this to date, fission has been conceived of as a really interesting thought experiment, a way to tease out the implications of different ways of understanding personal identity, but it's not been thought of as a real possibility. What's interesting about many worlds is of course, if the universe branches and that therefore the individuals within it branch as well, suddenly we have multiple versions of us that have undergone a process very much like these fission events that were discussed in philosophical literature. So I'm really interested in looking at that literature and seeing whether there's insights that we can gain there that we can apply to the context of many worlds to really interrogate what this interpretation of quantum mechanics means for the human person, for consciousness, and maybe even for the soul as well. So um, branching happens when the wave function splits, so when a quantum event happens, um, and that causes everything in the universe to branch as well. So um, as I've said, that causes there to be many worlds, um, many people within those worlds. There's a bit of disagreement amongst philosophers of physics about whether this splitting is emergent or fundamental. So um, some people argue that it's a fundamental process right there at the base level of reality. And some people argue that these worlds supervene on top of each other and they sort of um, emerge out of the quantum microphysics. There's still one ultimate reality, but we experience multiple supervenient worlds. So in terms of what actually happens when the universe branches, it's a really interesting and important philosophical question, but we're still unsure or people still disagree about exactly what's going on metaphysically there. And so of course, not truly understanding what happens when the universe branches, if it branches, means that the metaphysical implications are to an extent uncertain. But I think it's worth taking very seriously and it's worth thinking about what might happen if this splitting is there at the fundamental layer of reality. So as I've said, this has really interesting and potentially troubling implications for the existence of the human person. So philosophically and also um, kind of intuitively, we think of ourselves as being the same person that we were when we were born and that we'll be the same person for the rest of our lives. So, you know, I remember being these past stages of myself. I've experienced my body growing and changing from that of a child to that of an adult. Um, and I feel like I've been one person the whole time. But if the ever interpretation of quantum mechanics is true, then there might be hundreds, thousands, even millions of versions of me that have the same memories as me, that have the same experiences as I do. Um, but then the question is raised, okay, well, which of these hundreds or thousands or millions of people am I? I thought I was one person. How can I be millions of different people? 
And um, that's where some really interesting implications for theism come in as well, because theism, particularly Christianity, has the idea that you are the same person, you have the same soul throughout your life, and um, that God has this unique and individual relationship with each person. But if there's multiple people, then that sort of seems to start getting really messy as well. So philosophically and theologically, this idea of splitting persons is really, um, it's it, yeah, it, it gets you thinking. And I think we don't really have enough answers yet. And so what I wanted to do with the article that we're talking about today and future articles that I'm working on is say, look, there are some problems here that we need to really address and really give our attention to. And if we do, hopefully we can make progress. I don't think these problems are insurmountable, but at the moment we don't really understand what happens to the human person in a case of Ephraim branching. And I think that's a question we really do need to answer. So I guess um, I haven't properly answered your question in that what happens in during branching and what are the implications? I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but there's lots of fascinating themes that I'm beginning to explore and that I hope other people will start exploring as well. Well, um, I guess that's sort of what I was addressing in the last question or my last answer is that we don't exactly know. So one of the things that we believe is that people, or that we hope that we can believe, is that people do continue existing throughout their life. Um, but if fission occurs or if branching occurs, then we, um, we get into some difficult metaphysical territory. So there's a law called Leibniz's law, a metaphysical law, which says um, if two objects are the say are in fact the same objects, then they will have all the same properties. Um, and if two objects have different properties, then they're not the same object. So if we think about the evening star and the morning star, two different names, but they have exactly the same properties because they're both the planet Venus. So this is sometimes also called the identity of indiscernibles. If you can't tell the difference between two things, if they have exactly the same properties, then they are one and the same thing um but after a fission event or after branching i have will have different properties to one of the other individuals in a different universe so we'll have different streams of consciousness different spatial locations um o yeah occupying different space and in occupying different worlds so we cease being the same person if we follow leibniz's law but there's also a principle called the transitivity of numerical identity, which says if A is identical with B, B is identical with C, then C must be identical with A. So if I am identical with some past person, i.e. the pre-fission individual, and some other person in another world is identical with that past individual, then me and that person in another world should be identical as well. We should have all the same properties. But of course, as I've already said, that's not the case. So if Leibniz's law is true, then it seems like we're not actually identical with these past versions of ourselves. And the idea that we persist through time becomes much more difficult to accommodate. Now, some physicists have taken this problem on. So Sean Carroll says, look, the idea that we're the same person throughout our lives has never been more than a useful fiction anyway. So it's no great problem if Everett in quantum mechanics encourages us to get rid of that idea. He says we should think of ourselves as a branching tree or a splitting amoeba rather than one individual self going through time. So whether that's problematic or not is something, I mean, when people's intuitions will differ on this and people will feel, some people will feel more comfortable with that than others, but that's one of the ways of thinking about how we persist through time. Either we don't or um, our self or our sense of self is actually split across multiple different branches. Um, and, and both of those are quite problematic. So yeah, I do think we need to give more attention to this to try and come up with a robust understanding of personal identity that can withstand fission and that still makes sense of all of our intuitions about what it means to persist through time. <laughs> So uh, some people have argued, not very successfully, that if fission is going to occur or if branching is going to occur in your future 
And let's let's say for ease of explanation that you split into two people. The multiple occupancy view says, well, if you split into two people in the future, then there must be two occupants of your body now. So instead of being just one person, I am actually two people contained within the same body. Um, and this seems very, very counterintuitive. And um, Derek Parfit, who came up with the fish and thought experiments, dismissed this and said, uh, it's nonsensical. It doesn't make sense of what we believe about identity. And that's just in the case of splitting into two people. In the Everettian interpretation, we're talking about potentially splitting into an infinite number of people in the future. So that could mean, if the multiple occupancy view is true, that I contain an infinite number of people within me now. And when I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go and have dinner later, I don't know what that word I refers to. I can't say with certainty which of the multiple occupants within me is the I I'm referring to. And this, I think, seems so counterintuitive uh, that we would need a very, very high threshold of verification to accept it. So at the moment, I think we have, I think we're pretty justified in dismissing the multiple occupancy view as an option because it just seems to throw everything we think we believe out about identity out of the window. So it's an, it's an interesting proposal, but I think ultimately it's doomed to failure and we must look elsewhere to come up with a robust understanding of personal identity on the Everettian interpretation. So um, I'm just talking about the problem of evil as it's raised by the Everettian interpretation. Um, and so I guess I should take a couple of steps back and explain what I think is going on with the problem of evil and the Everett interpretation. So as I've said, there are multiple people or multiple versions of you if the Everett interpretation is true. And it's also the case that everything that's physically possible does happen. Everything that's compatible with the initial conditions and the evolution of the universal wave function uh, does happen. So if that's the case, then there are many versions of you, some living really, really great lives, some living the best life that it's possible for any version of you to live, but some living really awful, really terrible lives that are riddled with evil and suffering and pain. So um, an example of this might be that there's a field of, um, there's a growing field known as quantum biology, which identifies potential areas for quantum, um, potential influences of quantum processes in biological processes. So one of these is genetic mutations. It's thought now that genetic mutations have a quantum component to them and quantum processes may well, in fact, heavily influence genetic mutations. So if we're thinking about all possible quantum processes happening and all versions of you existing, then it must be the case that there are some versions of you with terribly painful genetic conditions and with cancer, because that can also be affected by mutation. And so basically the long and short of it is there are some versions of you living a great life and some versions of you out there living a truly terrible life. So universal salvation is probably the best way to go, uh, I think. Now there have been, uh, there are lots of criticisms of universal salvation in that it doesn't seem to be fair um, to allow people who've done terrible things to go to heaven. And I guess those are sort of tangential to the conversation that we want to have today. But those problems aside, it seems to me that it's, it's deeply unjust to not allow people to go to heaven just because they're in a different branch of the universe to Jesus. So universal salvation is probably the best solution to that problem. Now, whether it can withstand the other problems with it, I, yeah, um, I'm not uh, not sure. But I think uh, for the problem of salvation that I identified, that seems to me to be one quite promising solution. Well, um, I'd like to say thank you so much for inviting me to this interview. It's been really great to talk to you about this paper and this project. And thank you to anyone watching. Um, I guess final comments I'd like to say is that 
the paper that I wrote has only really scratched the surface. And my aim with it was to just survey some of the ground and see what problems might arise for theism in the context of Everettian quantum mechanics. I only was able to discuss a couple of problems, really the problem of um, persistence across time, the problem of evil and the potential problem of salvation. And there's lots of other problems that could arise. And then of course, we want to start constructing solutions as well. So in the future, I hope to do much more work on this. I've got another paper coming out soon on the notion of moral responsibility in many worlds and trying to see whether moral responsibility makes sense in the context of a continuously splitting universe with multiple versions of you within it. And then, yeah, I think I would love to see other people starting to take up the mantle and start constructing some solutions to this so that if the Everett interpretation does turn out to be true, which is a, a big open question, we just don't know yet, then theism and particularly Christianity will be well equipped to respond to any problems that arise because they'll have been thinking about it already. So yeah, I guess I just hope to see lots more people addressing this important question uh, or these important questions, I should say, there's many of them in the future. And thank you so much for having me today.